You're listening to the Noisy Neighbors Podcast. Hey, everybody. Noisy Neighbors Podcast. Joey McHugh and Mark Mulvaney. Um, we're going to talk about the man, the myth, the legend that is Fernandinho for what a little you? bit. This is a guy that we'll get into it, but he's he's criminally underrated and he's given so much to this club and there's a lot of questions surrounding what's going to happen at the end of this season with him. So we figured let's have a chat about Fernandinho since he's he's given and done so much for this club and maybe doesn't get talked about enough. Um, yep. Just to kind of explain where and how the whole Fernandinho story starts. This is a guy that City bought from Shakhtar Donetsk back in 2013 for 36 million pounds. Um, a guy that a lot of player, a lot of people hadn't heard of. Um, a guy that, when the transfer fee was announced, eyebrows were raised kind of across the world. Um, and then it comes out that he paid part of the transfer fee because he wanted to come to he wanted to get out of Ukraine so bad and come to City. Uh, if that doesn't endear the guy to you off the bat, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. Um. What a what a hell of a way to start everything. Go ahead. So he uh the first thing I remember about him, mate, is when he joined. Um you know you know this this thing they talk about a lot about unlocking Paul Pogba? <laughs> yeah. This guy unlocked Yaya Torre. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Talk talk to me about putting him and Torre in the same midfield. What you know, what Pellegrini was doing there. Yeah, so Fernandinho is a player that is so just smart and athletic and he he's he's malleable. It's it's this is a man who's been the linchpin of a midfield for two very different systems. One for Manuel Pellegrini, the manager that brought, brought him in, and now for Pep Guardiola. Um what Fernandinho allowed Yaya Torre to do was to be unleashed. Yaya didn't have to sit back as far as he did when he was next to a Gareth Barry or a Nigel de Jong um, or, you know, heaven forbid, an Owen Hargreaves. He was allowed to get forward and he was allowed to make these runs that once Yaya got up to speed, it was like trying to stop a freight train. And all of that was possible because you had a guy in Fernandinho that covered all of the area from sideline to sideline in the middle of the park where Yaya was free to go roam and go forward and help out players like Aguero and Negredo and um, Nazri, David Silva. I mean, name anybody that was a part of that front four that we played back when Pellegrini was here. And Yaya being able to go forward because of Fernandinho made that entire system work. 100%, mate. 100%. Yeah, so talk about sort of the evolution of him um, from – you know, essentially being part of a, a two yep. to to what I w- I've always described as essentially becoming a one man midfield. Um, right. You know, he, the, probably the best example and probably the best performance I've ever seen in a city shirt. A lot of people think it was Bernardo on that day, mm-hmm. but, and he was great, but really um, that almost title decider between Liverpool and City, right. 2018-19 season, yeah, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. whereas us and Liverpool going going for it, uh, he put in a performance again, best I've ever seen from a City player. He was a one man midfield that day. Talk to me about how he went from you know f- f- unlocking Torre to essentially becoming a one man midfield. It's I think it's most of it is down to just he's built he's built of different parts. I think. I mean, this is a guy that's made of things that most people aren't made of. He's he's got the lungs, it seems, of like an Olympic level long distance runner because he just doesn't get tired. His legs don't fade, um, and he's he's got the brain of a physicist, it seems, because he's he's able to go from playing as a part of a two man midfield where. A lot of times he had to be the defensive anchor and there was usually some space around him that he could receive the ball and kind of play a longer pass to Pep Guardiola comes in. Things get a lot more narrow. You're 
kind of range of support shrinks down. And in that system where you've got two eights are allowed to kind of just go anywhere they want. You've a lot of times you've got full backs that are bombing forward and you're kind of isolated in there. And what Fernandinho was able to do was to go from a guy that was used to working in a ton of space with the ball to becoming a guy that without the ball and miles of space to cover, it wasn't an issue to him. He was able to clean things up. He was able to destroy when he needed to. He has mastered the dark arts, unlike most players that have ever played the game. And even with doing all of that, early on when Guardiola came to City, Fernandinho was still able to be a creative player from a deep-lying midfield position. And he, he, he was doing things at the time that, not many midfielders in the Premier League have ever done. Uh, it's a short list, I think, of midfielders you can put in that kind of category. Who, who um, are they? So we're talking so, best holding midfielders in right. Premier League history. So well, I'll, I'll give you five names. Um, okay. There's there's other names that could be put in here. And in fact, I've seen plenty of lists where Fernandinho is not even in the top 10, which is mad to me. But a short list of five. So you've got, I think N'Golo Conte has got to be in there because even though he came on late in his career, it's a guy that at Leicester helped them do something that should have been impossible in winning the premier league title. And then he went to Chelsea and became not the second coming of, but damn near what Makalele was for them. in in uh, Antonio Conte's side, you've got Xabi Alonso who obviously uh, was, a maestro for Liverpool helped them win the champions league. And then he went on to Real Madrid where he was, you know, a mainstay there for a long time, made the move to Bayern Munich. I mean, this is just a guy that played the position differently than anybody else had played it up to that point. Gilberto Silva, a little bit of a throwback there, but part of the Arsenal midfield that, um, and part of an Arsenal side that was generational, and the things that he was able to do for Arsenal and Brazil at the time made him one of the best defensive midfielders on the planet when he was playing. Um, I think second place would be Fernandinho for a lot of the reasons we've already mentioned. Uh, he's he's malleable. He's smart. He's athletic. He's you can, he's just Mr. Reliable. Uh, the first place guy is Claude Makélélé, and I think oh. the reason – I thought you were going to go with Rodri, but that's it's cool. Makalele will do. <laughs> I, I think the reason that Makalele always will be until somebody comes along and just blows everybody else out of the water. I think the reason he'll always be the best defensive midfielder we've ever seen in the Premier League is because he revolutionized, along with Mourinho, he, he revolutionized a position and even a system, so much so that the, posi- the position became known as the Makalele role. Very um, true. No one else has ever done that. Maybe maybe Messi with the false nine, but no one calls it the Messi role. You still just call it the false nine. Yeah. Um, what Makalele was able to do with the Mourinho-Chelsea side where he, I think he kind of made the outline for how to be a one-man midfield with a three-man midfield. <laughs> um, and Fernandinho picked up the torch there, and he's he's gotten as close to anybody ever will, I think. To, uh, to Claude Makélélé in in the uh, now eight years he's been at seven or eight years he's been at City. I'm I'm uh, I'm liking that shout, mate. But I'm going to back our man. I'm going to back Fernandinho. Okay, as the greatest holding midfielder in Premier League history. I know it's not all about trophies and that, and, and maybe mm-hmm. he's not even he might not even be close to some of the other uh, holding uh, midfielders for trophies and that, but. Well, yeah, you, know, you throw like Roy, Roy Keane in there, and you get yeah, a million yeah, trophies. But, we don't, but you know, he was just less, a destroyer. Less said about him, the better. Yeah, you know. <laughs> um, let's talk about what he's won since he's been here, mate. Uh, what's uh, three Premier Leagues? Yep. One, one with Pellegrini, two with uh, Guardiola. Yep. A uh, hundred league cups. <laughs> yep, <laughs> I think that's um, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a couple of FA cups. Yep. Or just one. Because he, he, he came after the first one, didn't he? Yeah, so just right. one FA Cup, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, lots of trophies in the cabinet for Fernandinho in the Premier League. But it's it's that extra dimension for me in the in the attacking... Well, okay. 
So somebody like Xavi Alonso, uh, mm-hmm. Xavi Alonso, attacking wise, fantastic, but maybe mm-hmm. not the mobility of right. of a Fernandinho. Right. Somebody like Makaleli, who you had as, as your number one, and that's a great shout. Defensively, un unparalleled, but mm-hmm. maybe not the attacking threat that that Ferna is. You know. Yeah. Um, and, and lastly, you know, let's face it, he's got the best song. <laughs> True. He's got the best song out <laughs> out of all of them. Um, so uh, for me, I'm gonna I'm gonna go on record, Fernandinho. The best ever central defensive midfielder in the Premier League, a Manchester City player, a Manchester City legend. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, he stays on for a bit, a bit longer, mate. But uh, could potentially be his last season with us, and uh, deserves a send off that unfortunately uh, may or may not, you know, may not happen. Right. But get him back with David Silva, another criminally underrated player. As you, as Glad you, told you said me. that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> get them both There's- back in. For a testimonial when we can all be there and uh yeah let's just let them know what we yeah. think yeah if there's if there's two players that are maybe the most underrated midfielders in league history i think it would be fernandinho and david silva because david 100%. silva for whatever reason won't make lists of the best atta- he, he won't be top three of best you know attacking midfielders the league's ever seen which is absurd because the number one guy is wearing 17 for the blue boys right now. Uh, number one, a is the guy that used to wear 21 for us because he's, he quietly destroyed everything that everyone thought about what a premier league midfielder would be um, in the early part of the decade by just being fluid on the ball and finding space where space shouldn't exist and not being the type of guy that just runs around a bunch, but, actually yeah. is, is can pick a pass if, and not if you have don't to rate. If you don't rate David Silva or Fernandinho, you just don't know ball, mate. True. You know? <laughs> True. <laughs> what you, before we wrap this thing up, I do want to throw one question at you. Would you, I think I know the answer. If Fernandinho decides to hang it up at the end of this year and he wanted to coaching staff position, Keep him here. Keep him at yeah. home. You know yeah. he loves. I know he loves Manchester. Uh, who wouldn't? Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I think that you know for for South American players, yeah. Fernandinho's a draw. You know yeah. we're going to need South American players. We're going to need Brazilians mm-hmm. at, at the club. Um, I think he is would be you know not only a great coach but a great ambassador. He's an absolute class act, mate. Um, Family man, well settled in Manchester, so yep. keep him keep him around for sure. Nice. Let us know in the chat, um, would you have Fernandinho as a coach if he decided to hang it up at the end of this year or next even? Also, let us know in the chat, what is your top five um, for defensive midfielders in pr- Premier League history? I want to see where Fernandinho falls uh, with some of you guys. Um, if you liked this video, make sure you like, uh, hit the like button, and then subscribe to our channel and click the bell. Uh, we're trying to do a little bit more for YouTube these days than just doing the podcast. Uh, you can support us uh, through Patreon as well. If you go to patreon.com slash noisy pod for just $1 a month, you can support the show and help us do more videos and other stuff um, at noisy pod on Twitter and uh, go check out the podcast. If you like what you heard here, if you want something more long form and until next time, everybody, ta-ra. Ta-ra.